This episode of Legends the Series, brought to you by Quartermax. Take your car to the max. I think I upset a few people through the years, but I think those people may be the ones that are still out here today because I did upset them at the time. And, and a lot of people think that I am a grumpy old dude on the starting line, but I'm not. Take me away from the races or take me away from the race car, I'm about as crazy as anybody else. The reason I'm grumpy and the reason that I was that attached, I wanted to make sure nobody ever got hurt on my watch because something I did. Every car that went down that racetrack was as safe as I could possibly make it as far as visually what I was looking at. I was 13 years old, my best friend in the area where I lived wanted me to go to Lions Drag Strip with his dad. So I went to Lions and the the instant I went to the drag races, I was hooked. And he asked me if I wanted to uh, do the time slip, hand out the time slips to the racers. Well, here's a 13 year old kid out there uh, with all these people, and it's the most exciting sport in the world, and I'm handing out time slips to them, and here I was, I, my folks didn't have a nickel for entertainment, and they gave me a $5 uh, money deal, or $5 card for lunch, and I'm getting I'm getting paid food-wise and entertainment and everything to get in the track free. It was unbelievable. And the, at 13 years old, I was just totally hooked on drag racing. Drag racing in the early days was unbelievably exciting. And when I decided that I wanted to be out on a starting line, I don't think there was a better part to be, a position to be in in drag racing than be on the starting line. And I went out there and, and instantly got hooked to doing that too. But originally I was a flag starter. And being a flag starter, uh, there was there, there was a lot of danger. I, I never got hurt in a race car, in all the race cars I ever drove. But I've been run over and blown up from starting, and uh, many many times. And I've I've got a lot of broken bones, but uh, starting I loved. When, the, when Garlis did his burnout, I could tell that something was wrong with the car. Right? And I watched thousands and thousands of cars uh, running. When he did the burnout, the car didn't move right, and I knew something was wrong here. It's like almost like the axle was broken in the car. So I was ready for something to happen. And when the car, when the when I turned the light on, next thing I know, 
it just instantly exploded. So I was ready to to uh, to to do something because I was I knew something was wrong. Well, even T.C. Lemon, he said I cheated. And this is years ago when he was talking about the accident because I was the first one there. The instant it happened, I had to go around the pole, pick up the fire extinguisher, and go directly over to Garland's and. Uh, TC had w ran straight from where he was standing behind the car to Garlitz, and I beat him there. Uh, it was a bad situation, and uh, so I saw Garlitz with the foot hanging down to his heel, and I checked everything out there, but because CJ had given me many positions, CJ Hart, many positions to where not only was I the starter, I was the ambulance attendant, the system manager when he was not there, and also I had to check the crowd in case there was a situation. Well, I looked up in the grandstands to make sure everything's okay, and that's when I saw the young gentleman up in the grandstands that uh, was bleeding pretty bad. So I went and left the situation with Garlitz, and Mickey Thompson was there taking care of that. I ran around to the other side of the old tower and on the back side there was a gate that got into the grandstands. Well it was one of the gates with one of the emergency bars on the inside. Well nobody was looking my way and the guard had left there that normally would lock it and had the key so he had gone to the accident with Garland, not knowing that somebody in the grandstands had gotten hurt. <laughs> so I asked him. I mean, I was yelling at the spectators to open the gate and nobody heard me. So adrenaline takes over and I ripped the gate off its hinges. And they later had to put a new gate on it because it got totally bent. Well, I ran up in the grandstands and uh, the gentleman's arm was pretty much severed. And uh, he was bleeding pretty bad. So I, uh, knowing pressure points, being an ambulance, attended because in those days you only had to have the driver. I stuck my thumb in his armpit and uh, it uh, instantly stopped the blood and uh, they brought the they brought the stretcher up to, to take him to the hospital and I told Pete I, I can't let go because he'll die. So I held him to the hospital and got there in the hospital and Garlitz is on the gurney behind me and I'm kind of standing between Garlitz and the gentleman that was hurt and uh, he uh, he asked me how the kid was doing. I said, well, he's got a pretty good cut, but he'll he'll be all right. I didn't want to scare Don anymore. Don said, I looked over and his foot is still down by his heel. And he said that, uh, well, I won't have, I told him, I said, you got a pretty good cut too. And he said, well, I won't have to worry about ingrown toenails for a while. So, next thing I know, the doctor came in and said, what do we got? I said, I can't let go. So, he uh, tied him off, he tied him off, and then they uh, uh, took him in and filled him up with blood. He was basically empty. When the doctor came out and told me, it would have been just a couple more minutes and he would have been gone. So, and I didn't see the gentleman for many, many years, and uh, I heard that they saved the arm, <laughs> and uh, I had talked to Don about it, they said he, he saved the arm, and I never heard a word. Well, one day they were writing a book on the transition of uh, the front motor car to the rear motor car, and uh, so I, I told them about the whole story, and they were looking for the gentleman that was in uh, in the grandstands that got hurt. So somehow they found it on Facebook that he was talking about he was the one in the grandstands. Well, they got a hold of him and told him the whole story. And uh, he said that he didn't know who it was that saved his life, but a couple friends told him that it was me. And uh, the last thing he remembers before he passed out was that he had a horrible pain in his armpit and this black gentleman standing over the top of him. 
Well, the black gentleman happened to be a black cowboy hat. And so uh, they told him the whole situation and he wanted my phone number and he ended up calling me when I was in Utah building the house in Cedar City, Utah. And uh, he said, I've got to meet you. And I said, I'm in Utah right now. And he said, well, I'll, uh, I'll come to Utah. I said, no, I'll be back in California because the house wasn't done. I'll be back in California and, and we'll get together. And when we did, it was very emotional. When nobody was around after after the race, after it was over, it was it was a bad situation. It was one, it was the worst situation. And there's there was a lot of bad. Don't get me wrong. Uh, a lot of people know about the situation, regardless. But in the early days, the safety was not like it is today. Today, I, I'm very proud to say that the people involved have improved the safety so much and in the early days being the ambulance attendant, ambulance attendant along with the starter I uh, I've seen the worst and Garlitz's deal was pretty bad but I've seen worse I never second guess myself about sending somebody down the track I always carry wrenches on the starting line I want to make sure that I wanted to make sure that everybody who went down my racetrack was as safe as they could be and I'm sure I upset a lot of people maybe shutting off with an oil leak or whatever but I did everything I could to make sure that that, that race car was as safe as it could be and the driver's safety equipment was all attached his seat belts were tight Dealing with some of the drivers that were upset, I had a, different issues with different ones. I had my best friends that I raced against come up and be so upset with me for different reasons and call me every name under the sun. And you know what? Adrenaline gets everybody pumped up and I just let them cuss me out and they walked away and later they would come back and apologize. But there were situations to where a few drivers came up and they started putting their hands on me. And uh, <coughs> I'm half Irish and I get a little upset. And uh, we did a few dances on the starting line, if you know what I mean. I started at Irwindale, Orange County, all of Division 7 many times. I've started across the nation. When I was working for Evans and Donor, uh, they had the multiple racetracks and all the big events, I would start the big events for them where the race was. Like they had Irwindale and if there was a big race in Orange County, I would be the starter in Orange County and my backup would take over the others. But I seemed like I was going around to the different events uh, on a weekly basis because Donor had many, many racetracks. was it for you to flip the switch between being a starter and being a driver? 
being a starter and being a driver is pretty close to the same. It has a lot to do with safety. It has a lot to do with what you're looking at and making sure everything's right and you want to do the best job you can, period. Being a starter, you're really, you're really, your attention is totally set on what's going on at that moment, just like it is with driving. I, I enjoyed doing both. Uh, there was a situation with uh, Evans at one time when I was driving and many times I raced and started at the same event. And one event, uh, Evans had a situation where he said, you're either gonna have to be the starter or drive your race car. I said, see you, Steve, I'm going racing. He goes, wait a minute, let's talk about this. Uh, we'll let you do both. <laughs> Drag racing, I'm Paul Page with Steve Evans, and Larry Sutton brings his top fueler to the line as he is about to face John Kimball. What he's about to do is the burnout. It's extremely important. It's important. It's also very exciting, Paul. Not only are you heating the tires, you're also putting down a track of hot, sticky rubber down on that pavement for more traction. And for a top fuel dragster to be effective in the quarter mile, you have to pass it in the five-second round. John Kimball, a trucking company operator and weekend drag racer versus Larry Sutton. Sutton, the biggest surprise of this event. He was not even expected to qualify, let alone be around for the quarterfinals. The quarterfinal round, top fuel dragster in the world finals of drag racing. A race within a race, not only to determine a victor here today, but we will also break a three-way battle for the world championship. It is Larry Sutton in the near lane, John Kimball in the far lane, as they stage their top fuelers. Larry Sutton here in the tower lane, usually the starter here at Orange County International Raceway. They are dead even until Sutton suddenly pulls ahead by a couple of car lanes, Paul. Something apparently going wrong with Kimball's car and the Sutton crew enjoying every minute of this, their brightest day in drag racing. So Larry Sutton picks up a quarterfinal round win with a 6.14, 200 and... Do you think that the racers had that much trust in you to do the right thing that it didn't really matter if you were starting and racing? The racers had a lot of trust in what I did. Number one, I built my own race cars. I tuned my own race cars. Uh, and I drove the race cars. Also being the starter, they, uh, they had trust in me not only to make sure that their car was right and I looked over it, I just wasn't up there just to punch, push the button. I was up there to make sure that that gentleman went down the racetrack as safe as he could, but also make sure that he was safe uh, as far as his equipment and everything. And right now, here I am at Bakersfield, and I've got a wrench in my pocket, my back pocket, that fits fuel lines. I never go to the starting line without one. And I'm racing with friends of mine out here, and I had wrenches on the starting line, and they allowed me to work on their race cars because, or tighten up fuel lines and everything, because they knew I was also a racer, let alone a starter. There were a lot of situations that really got me emotion-wise. Uh, yes, and and I I don't want to get into too many details, but uh, I've been the starter and the first one there, and I've I've removed a lot of fatalities from from the race cars, and uh, very emotional. Yes, uh, you have to understand it. The starter, maybe starter today, just pushed the button. In those days, I'm the last person they saw. And uh, when you uh, when you're the last person that they saw, and to give you an example, one gentleman had forgot to tighten up his put his seatbelts tight, and uh, I pointed to him that he needed to tighten his seatbelts, and he couldn't reach him. And he signaled for me to lean in the car. That was a funny car. And I tightened his seatbelts up. And uh, 
I told him be careful because the car was a violent car. And the drivers can hear you from the outside, but you can't hear them because of the noise of the motor. And I tightened up his seat belts and told him be, be careful. And uh, I hit the switch and a few seconds later he was gone. Very emotional, yes it was. The, the most defining part of my racing career was actually my driving. And it was, it was funny and it was also exciting. Uh, I was driving the Circuit Breaker top fuel car. And it was, uh, I had just won the uh, Nitro Champs at Orange County. And uh, I was having trouble walking then. Well, a couple of weeks later, uh, I had had to take off work because I had a ruptured disc in my back. Bob Richardson, who never came to my house to speak of, came to see if I could drive the race car. He said, I've got to have a doctor's release. Well, you have to understand that uh, I was on the couch when he showed up. My late wife let him in the door and uh, I, I said that you, you need to, uh, I, if, if I had to get a doctor's release, then I'd have to go back to work and I couldn't do that. And he, he was there for about two hours and I had to go to the bathroom when he showed up. So uh, he said, you sure you can drive the race car? I said, absolutely, I can drive the race car. And then after a while he decided he was gonna leave. So I said, I'm not gonna show you to the door and he said, that's okay. I, I know you're not feeling good, but I'll see you Saturday. And uh, so he left and I had to roll off the couch because I, I couldn't take one step. I had a ruptured disc that had gone down four vertebrae and was stuck with everything wrapped around it. And my wife says, how are you gonna be able to drive the race car? I said, you watch. So came Saturday, I crawled down the stairs. I crawled in the garage. I grabbed the door handle on my 280ZX, pulled myself up in the car, drove to the racetrack, parked alongside uh, a chair at the, at the trailer, and uh, they, they didn't realize what I was doing. So they uh, had the race car ready and they said, well, let's fire it up. And this is 11 o'clock in the morning for the PDA at Orange County. So I said, can you bring the car back here? And uh, so they brought it back and I grabbed the roll bar and they lifted my leg and they put me in the race car and uh, warmed it up. Then I, they helped me out. Well, this went on all day. The race started at 11 o'clock in the morning and finished at 2.30 the next morning at Orange County. It was a 32 car top fuel show. I won the whole race and at the end of the event, I came back and they had packed everything in the trailer because it was final round and I lay on the ground. I got out of the truck and I laid on the ground. Richardson comes up and he goes, come on, get up, we gotta go take the winning pictures. I said, you guys go take the winning pictures, I can't walk. Did you get hurt? Because he thought I'd hurt myself with my back in the car. I said, no, I, Bob, have you seen me take one step the whole day? Because he was totally involved in the motor. I said, you see me take one step? I'm laying down in the truck, putting on my fire suit. They pull the truck up along. I never took one step. He said, well, you lied to me. I said, no, Bob, you asked me if I could drive the car. You never said a word about, can you walk? So, you know, I won, I won the event. I didn't lie to him. And uh, two weeks later, I had surgery. Two weeks later, I'm driving the Seattle National Event. Well, the, stre the streakers and different things that go crazy at the racetrack, you know, a lot of people have shortcomings and they have to go out there on the starting line. And uh, 
do do their do their spectacular things, but they weren't too bad. We could always get a we could always get a guard and have them run them down. But working for Donor, uh, he was always into the big crazy show. Funny cars down the end of the quarter mile through the center. You'll see Bob Carell coming down in his flying kite cycle, and here he goes, ladies and gentlemen. All eyes the other end of the quarter mile. The torches are lit. Here comes Bob Carell. One time, and I had an intercom that I would uh, listen to what was going on to make sure everything was going on safety-wise. And I heard a situation that went on up in the grandstands where one of our security guards called the tower and he says, uh, tower, donor, he says, there's a woman up here in the grandstands that's, uh, her hair's on fire. Well, I guess she had a lot of hairspray and everything. And, uh, donor gets back on the microphone. He says, give her $50 and have her run down the track. So, you know, he was always into something spectacular. When I'm gone, I would like my legacy to be that I I prepared every single race to make everybody as safe as I could. And it didn't matter who you were, white, black, good friend, worst friend, doesn't matter. You got the best shake you could get on the starting line. And also, a racer that loved to race too. And that's why I did them both and I, I would not miss another day. I loved everyone that came out to my racetrack, and everybody says, "Well, he's the he's the killer of the track," referring to different different racers. Every racer that went down my track was a hero. If we lost them, they're really my hero because I mean they they're the they're the stars of the sports, the ones that we lost that nobody will ever let's say honor or whatever, but they. They're the stars of the sport, but I just want my legacy to be that I treated everybody the same way. Some of them may not like it, but I treated everybody the same way and that they felt safe when they went down my racetrack. But when they raced against me, they knew I was gonna cut their throat out. <laughs>